All right, so I see you're turning in your homeworks. Good. Uh, the goal will be to get them graded and back to you within a week. We have three graders, so supposedly we can get that done. Um, you'll already find another homework up there on the website. It is due, uh, I think according to schedule, will be due a week from today. So everything got changed because of the cancels, uh, the one class got canceled, so um, schedule's been modified accordingly, so you might want to take a look at it. But homeworks now look like they'll be due mainly on Tuesdays instead of Wednesdays for reasons that you'll see when you look up there. Okay, let me see if there's anything else. Okay, so this week's been screwed. I mean, the f first part of the semester has been screwed up, <laughs> obviously. So, um, you know, I see you got the homework done. It, I'm not saying it's correct. I just see a big pile of it here. So, normally we'll have the help sessions, that, but, you know, because of the snow, like, it was difficult. I don't think they had it, but normally the it'll be due. The homeworks will be due on t Tuesdays, I believe. So that means that we'll we'll be there. We is a euphemism for other people than me. Um, we'll be there Sunday and Monday nights. I think it was five to seven. I sent out an announcement. I sent out the room. It's supposed to be the two nights before the homeworks due. Okay. So if it's due Tuesday, that would mean Sunday and Monday. All right. And so I would encourage you to go if you have questions, um, because if, if, if they end up telling me not a lot of people are coming, we'll modify it, because I don't want to make them sit there two hours, two nights in a row if not a lot of people are coming. Okay? All right. So without further ado, so this week we have at the usual thing, two lectures, one on uh, today, which will be on these two types of distributions that we're going to use a lot, and then... Um, the next lecture, which is on Thursday, is on something called confidence intervals, and then we do another MATLAB thing tomorrow. Okay. And uh, okay. And so that you'll need the lectures today and Thursday to do the homework, or do you, you can just do it without the lectures, but it'll help probably. That's the idea. Okay. So um, last time, which was Thursday, I guess, we talked. Ab I introduced the idea of uh, distribution functions. We talked about two types of distribution functions. Um, the first one being what we call little f of x. So often refer to that as the density function, but in the book they just call that the probability distribution function. Okay, and then there was capital F of x, which was the cumulative distribution function. We talked both about cases where this random variable x was a continuous variable, or random, vari x, w random variable x was a discrete variable, okay? And we'll, I'll talk about that again um, today. All right, so last time we covered this in a very general sense, and today I'm going to introduce, well, three specific distribution functions that we're going to use in the class, and they're the three listed on the slide right there, okay? Binomial. Um, distribution, which is a discrete distribution, the Poisson distribution, which is a, a simplified version of the binomial distribution that I'll explain, and then the one we're going to use by far the most, which is the normal distribution, which I think you guys have seen in one context or another. Okay, so this is a, a slide that's just been copied, so it's nothing new, but just to review. Um, if we have a discrete probability distribution, we're talking about our random, so you know the notation we have. The actual random variable is called x, and little x are samples of it usually. So in this case, our random variable can assume some number of discrete values, x1, x2, x3. Um, you know, we always use the example of like rolling a dice or something like that. So there's a certain number of events or outcomes that can occur, and they're discrete things. They're not continuous, okay? And then we introduce this, which is the distribution function, little f of x. And so the definition of this is it's equal to some probability if the random variable equals that particular value and otherwise is zero. And I'll show you an example of what this looks like, for example, for the binomial distribution. You'll get a better idea when you see it. So that is what we call the probability function, probability distribution function. Then there's the cumulative distribution function. And that's defined as this. So if I, if I have the cumulative distribution function f of x, I can find what that is from the probability function. So if I'm interested in the, the when is xj going to be less than or equal to x, I can just add up all the individual probabilities. So if I'm interested in 
when if I roll a dice, will it be four or less? Then I add up the probability that it'll be one, two, three, and four. That's all this is saying. Okay? So that just means add up the probabilities. So we're interested, we use the probability function if we're interested in what is the probability of a certain event occurring. Okay? And we use the cumulative distribution function if we want to ask the question, what is the probability this will happen, or, you know, so you'll get a, this event or less or this or larger or something like that. Okay? So this is particular value. This is usually for a range um, less than or equal to something. And then we can calculate these type of probabilities. So if you want to know what the probability is, the random va variable between some limits A and B, you take the cumulative distribution function evaluated B subtracted off at A, which if you were plug all these things in, you'd see nothing more than adding up the probabilities that are between these two ranges here. And we know by definition of this being a proper uh, distribution function, all the probabilities have to add to one. Okay. So in other words, you take the probability of everything occurring and add them together, it has to equal one. All right. All right. So the binomial distribution, other than the normal distribution, is probably the one we'll use the most. Okay. So it's a discrete probability distribution. It has lots of different applications. Um, the ones I pick and the ones you'll see usually have to do with discrete manufacturing, like you're making things. When I say making things, I don't mean like you're, oh, here we go. You okay? <laughs> she crashed her car this morning. I feel terrible for her. Okay. But I'm going to reward you with this. Thank okay. You. All right. Have fun. It's a consolation prize of sorts. <laughs> I told him we'd try to get him back within a week. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. I just showed my sensitive side. You might have seen that. All right. All right, so the binomial distribution is a discrete probability distribution. Usually for us it has um, applications in things like discrete manufacturing. You're making discrete parts or, you know, I always use the idea of thin films or something like that. To so be contrasted with a chemical process, right? Chemical process is not discrete. You have a, like liquid <laughs> making some product like ethylene or something like that. So usually it's due to discrete manufacturing. This distribution um, governs this is the key point, I think, if you understand this to start with. So this governs the probability that some event will occur a certain number of times in n trials. So in other words, you want to know how often an event will occur if you do 100 experiments. Okay? So you'd be interested in something like, what's the probability this, this event A will occur 12 times if I do 100 experiments? That kind of thing. Okay? That probability is governed by the binomial distribution. So it's characterized by two probabilities, P and Q. So the probability that A will occur in any one trial, one trial means one experiment. So the probability that A will occur, yet in any particular context, you have to define what A means. But so A occurring has a probability called P. Okay? So for example, if you want to know what's the probability you'll get a heads, you'd call that P, obviously be 0.5. The probability of everything else occurring, which is also known as A not occurring, because these things are disjoint, right? You can't, ha you can't have A or B occurring at the same time, um, is called Q. It's 1 minus P, okay? And I put in A complement, right? Because A complement is everything but A, right? We already covered that. So the probability of A occurring in any, so you do one experiment. The probability that you'll get A as an outcome is P. The probability you'll get something other than A occurring is 1 minus P. So it's not, not too complex, okay? And in this case, this random variable x is the number of times A will occur if you do n experiments, okay? So again, um, you'd be interested in if you did 10 experiments, how many times would A occur? Like, would it, what's the probability of occurring three times or five times or whatever, okay? So this is governed by, so th this is, um, kind of in words, what we're trying to describe with the binomial distribution. Here is it in things other than words, which is how we prefer, I think. Okay, so x is a random variable and it can take on this number of, it can take on these values. So in other words, if I do n experiments and I want to know how many times a occurs, it can never occur more than n times. That's the number of experiments you did. So it occurs zero times, one time, two times, all the way up to n. So you know. If you did 100 experiments, there's some probability that 99 times you would get the outcome you're looking for, called A, right? So the idea here is if um, you 
x is equal to m, then what you're saying here is a occurred in m trials. In other words, you did, a, you did n experiments, little n. Okay. m of those experiments was obviously less than or equal to n. You got a. n minus m times you did not get a. You got something else. Okay. So this is, this is the distribution function for the binomial distribution. So you remember this binomial coefficient? That's what got its name. It's defined like this, right? So if we have n over x, n and x are both integers in this case. It has this formula. You've already seen this, I think, for like combinations, right? So this is just shorthand notation for this, which has to do with the number of combinations, obviously. And then we have this, um, p to the x, so probability, remember p is the probability a will occur, that's to the x power, x is the number of times it actually did occur, okay? Q is the probability that it did not occur, it's 1 minus p, and n minus x is the number of times um, it did not occur, okay? So I think I'm going to jump ahead to this picture here, I think it helps you understand um, how this works. So this is a plot of the, of the probability function. In this case, n is fixed to be 5, so it's easy for you to see. And then it's showing you what the distribution function looks like for different probabilities, p. Okay. So you understand the idea here is you want to know if I do five experiments and the probability is 0.1 that I get the outcome called a, okay, what's the probability I'll get either I'll get a 0 times or a 1 time or a 2 times, 3, 4, or 5. Okay. If the probability is low, 0.1, then there's a pretty good probability A won't occur a single time if you do five experiments. Does that make sense to you? Right? The probability of getting A in any particular experiment is 0.1. The probability of getting, not getting A a single time in five experiments is relatively high because the probability of each experiment is relatively low. The probability of getting five in all five experiments is, it's, it's not zero. It's so small you can't see it. That should make sense, right? So chance of success is only 10%. If you do five experiments, what's the probability all five will su succeed? It's really small. So this shows other values, but if you go to this limiting case over, or say the opposite case, so this is when the probability is really high that you'll get success. You'll get A. So if, that's, so if the probability of doing an experiment getting A in an individual experiment is 90%, then it's pretty likely you'll get all five experiments to be successful. It's not one you know, but it's relatively high. It's very unlikely none of them will be successful, right, which makes sense. 90% probability any one experiment will be successful. It's not likely all five will fail. So you, you get the idea? So this is what this distribution function looks like if you plot it, okay? This is the equation that's been plotted, okay? So what they did in that particular case is they computed this function here, right? I specified a value p, so either 0.1 or 0.9 for the two cases I went over. Q is 1 minus P. N is 5 for that case, right? That's the number of experiments. And then they plotted this function for different values of X. X equals 0, X equal 1, X equal 2, all the way up to 5. And if you do that, you get those right there. All right? Okay, so for whatever case, for whatever reason, I wanted to do this. I wanted to see if this function made sense to me. So usually, if someone gives me a function like this or something, it's not obvious to me, right? Is that, that's not obvious to me that this governs the probability <laughs> of what they're describing. So I decided that I would simplify this function for x equals zero and x equal n to see if the answer made sense then. Do you, so it just gets, gives you a little further insight to how the function works. So if x equals zero, what does that mean? That means I did n experiments and not a single one of them did I get a. Okay. So if x is zero, then you can plug that into this equation, x being, z x being zero. So first of all, you have to calculate this, right? Because x is zero. So just plug in n and zero into this formula here and you'll see that equals one. And then come over here. And if x is 0, then you get p to the 0, you get q to the n. If you, if you write out this whole thing, well, it's pretty obvious, right? Because that thing's 1, that thing's 1. You just get q to the n. So this says, if, if um, you're interested in the case um, of doing, let's say, 10 experiments and not a single one of them is successful, then you take the probability of failure and just multiply it times 10 times. 
Okay? So that made sense to me at least. So I did the same case for the other limiting case. That's where x equals n. That's every single one of the experiments is successful. You get a. Again, the binomial coefficient x becomes n, you get this. Plug it all in, you'll see that's 1 again. And now you can evaluate this part of the equation. For x equal n, you get this. That thing's 1, that thing's 1, so you just get p to the n. Remember, p is the probability you'll have a successful experiment, if you will. You'll get a. And so if you do five experiments and you want to know the probability all five will be successful, it's multiply the probability n times. Okay. So the point is, I could figure this out by myself without this function, and I could also figure this out without this function. It's all the cases in between that I need the function for, right? Someone asked me if I do 100 experiments, what's the chances they'll all be successful? I, I got that one, right? That's that. I do 100 experiments, none of them will work. That's that one. But someone asked me, what's the chance I do 100 experiments and 13 will be successful? I would never be able to figure that out myself. So that's what the, that's what the function is for here. Okay. So I already showed you this. This should give you some feel for what the um, function looks like for some simple case. All right, so if you were to calculate the mean, so at this point, if you have the distribution function, this guy, you can calculate the true mean and the true variance. You, you remember the distinction? Okay. So only if you have the probability function can you know the true mean and the true variance. Usually you calculate them from samples. That's called the sample mean and the sample variance. So for this particular distribution function, the mean is equal to this. N, that's the number of experiments you did, times the probability P. Okay? P being the number of, of the probability of successful experiment. The variance, the sigma squared, is N, P, and also times Q. Okay? How did you figure these out? You can take the definition of what you mean, the mean and the variance to be, take that distribution function and compute them, but I'm just giving them to you. Okay? If you have a case where the probability of success, which I'll call P, that's where you get A, and failure, that's where you get Q, everything but A, is, are both 0.5. That should, there's only one case I know where this is true. That's where you flip a coin. <laughs> okay, right? If you flip a coin, equal probability, you get heads or tails, then you can simplify this function and it ends up looking like this. We don't use that too much, but I put it in there anyway. So in other words, this thing is 0.5, this thing is 0.5. So then you'll get 0.5, in other words, to the n power because the x will cancel there because p and q are the same. All right? All right, so here's an example. Some of these examples, I have to admit, I've done for the first time this semester. And so there's always a chance. What, when, one thing you've learned from probability is always a chance, <laughs> right? There's always a chance I'll be wrong, uh, that I made a mistake. So if you were ever to think I made a mistake, either in the class, in which you're pretty insightful because it moves a little bit quickly to maybe see it easily in, when we go into the class, but either in the class or outside the class, either if you see it in the class, just raise your hand so you don't understand something seems wrong. Um, and if it's outside of class, send me an email, and then I'll look at it, and if it's wrong, I'll fix it and repost it. Okay. They, sh they should be right, but it's hard to be. It's hard to always be right. Okay. All right. So here's a question here. So this is just an example of how you use this. So somebody, a plant, a plant that manufactures solar thin films. So they know from historic, for, by historical reasons, like they've been making these thin films for 10 years, and they know on average the probability of making a good film is about 99%. Okay, so it's pretty high. That's how they stay in business. So then, let's say somebody wants to buy 50 of these thin films, and they want to be assured that there'll be only a single, they'll, so this is exactly, well, this would be a little bit of a weird question, but typically you'd ask the question, I want no more than one defective film out of 50. Like, in other words, you can't go to someone that makes these and said, I need a 100% guarantee they're always good. It doesn't work that way. So maybe someone's willing to buy 50 of these films and say, I'll accept one of them not working, but no more. And they want to know what the probability of that occurring is if, if each film has a probability of being 99% good. Okay? So you get the question. If you make a th single thin film, there's a 99% chance it'll be okay. They w and then you're asking this question. If I make 50 of these films, what's the chance that only one of them will be bad? Okay? All right. So... 
the key thing to obviously using this function, sorry to flip around, is that you need to identify P, N, and X, right? Because Q is just 1 minus P, so that's pretty easy. So you need for a particular problem to know what N is, what X is, and what P is. Well, I gave you P, there it is, 0.99. Okay. I gave you N, 50. 50 is the total number. Okay. All right, so I'm using 49 here because if there's only a single defective film, that means 49 of them are good, right? So this is the probability that the film is good. So I could either um, use, what I'm doing here is using this probability, and then this is the number of success, this is the number of good films, right, which is 50 minus 1, because I tell you only one can be defective. Alternatively, you could have, I could tell you the probability of failure is 0.01, and then you would calculate 50 over 1. Do you understand that? Yeah, you could do it either way. I'm doing it this way. So first of all, calculate this thing. So when you calculate these binomial coefficients, the first thing to realize is hopefully something cancels, right? Because if you try to put some of these numbers in your calculator, you'll be in trouble. So you plug these numbers into the definition where that's n and that's x, you get this. And first of all, what's 50 minus 49? Well, that's 1 factorial, okay? So you have 40, 50 factorial over 49 factorial, that's 50, right? So usually you can simplify these things without it. Because sometimes you'll get things like where that's 2,500 factorial or something like that, and you can't even calculate that. So it better, you better be able to simplify before calculating. So you get 50. And then you just use the formula. So again, I'm asking the question, what's the probability I'll have 49 successful thin films in a batch of 50, which is directly addressing this question. I already calculated that coefficient. The good news is you got your homework, right? Yes. The bad news is the lady took them away already. <laughs> so you'll have to catch up with her and try to give an explanation as to what occurred. All right. So we already calculated that's it. And then we have um, P, the probability of success, to the um, n power. Well, sorry, I have to keep flipping back and forth. We're using this formula right here. So we're going to put P to the x power. So P is 0.99. That's 49. This is 0.01 to the y n minus that one power, first power. So that's where I get this. And if you calculate that, it ends up being about 31%. Yeah? What did I? Yeah, this has to do with the number of combinations that you can get. You, so, I mean, it, for lack of any better explanation, that in order to use to compute this distribution function, you have to calculate both this binomial coefficient and also evaluate these, these terms here. Um, this comes from somehow, and I'm, I would have to go back and look at the derivation, accounting for the number of possibilities or number of combinations. That's why this appears in the first place. But Okay, sorry, where am I? Okay, so that means 30%. So, so that's, right? So it says that's actually not that probable. Yeah, I mean, the, look at the, the formulas right there, right? You want to calculate, this is the probability function. You want to calculate the probability that 49 of the 50 will be good. So you have to evaluate this probability function. Probability function requires that binomial coefficient. I used it, sorry. I used it, you, you can't see it, <laughs> but this is the, I directly, this is right, n over x. Yeah, and, and I plugged in that number 50 for this thing right here. Yeah, it's, it's used. I just didn't write it all the way out, but yeah, it's pl I plugged in 50 right there. All right. So this is, I don't know if it's surprising or not, but actually there's only a 30% chance that you'll have one defect. What I should have done to make this more interesting, I should have, probably should have calculated what's the probability you'll have either zero or one defects. Because I'm sure if one defects okay, I'm pretty sure zero will be okay for the person. And so that would be slightly higher, but it's still nowhere near 99%, okay? All right, so that's an example of how you use the binomial distribution. That's a, okay. So now there's a simplification of this that's a little easier to work with called the Poisson distribution. And um, so this is a simplification of the binomial distribution under the following conditions. First of all, P has to be small. That's what this means. You know how math works, I hope. 
So somebody derives things under certain conditions. And the condition this is derived under, P is infinitesimally small and N is, is arbitrarily large, infinitely large, right? This is the theoretical justification for the, what we're going to do, but this doesn't have to be true for you to use it. You get? So, so if P is really, really small and N is really, really big, right? P is the probability of A occurring, N is the number of samples. So you're considering the case P is getting very large, I'm sorry, very small, N is getting very large, and you have the additional r requirement, which is kind of a technical requirement, that the mean of this distribution, which is N times P, goes to, it goes to a constant. But the real thing is we're assuming the probability of what we're interested in is really small and the number of samples is really large. Then the binomial distribution converges in a mathematical sense. If you guys remember convergence when you like, took freshman in calculus? Okay converges to this distribution. So this, is a, this, this ends up being a little easier to work with than the binomial distribution. So under conditions where P is small and N is large, you'd rather use this. If, if P is not small or N is not large, you, you shouldn't use this, right? <laughs> this will give some error compared to the binomial distribution. The error will be small if P is small and N is large. But if you try to use this equation where P is 0.5 and N is 12, you'll get a terribly wrong answer, all right? All right, so this is the binomial, this is the, sorry, the Poisson distribution. One thing you'll learn about applied mathematics is if you're a famous mathematician and you came around at the right time, you've got all kinds of things named after yourself. Like Poisson is a famous mathematician, he has lots of things. You notice there's nothing called the Henson distribution. It's not because I'm not capable. It's just I came too late, okay? So this is the Poisson distribution. So it governs, again, it governs the exact same thing. If we do n trials, what's the probability of x occurring? Um, and x can take on some number of discrete values. So this is a int very interesting distribution in the sense that the, the variance, sigma squared of the distribution and the mean are equal to each other. Okay? Just happens to be a property of this particular distribution. And when applicable, which I've been over 12 times, right, p small, n large, it's easier to work with this distribution than the binomial distribution. And I'll give you an example of that in a minute. So this is not so easy to see. I don't know why he likes to use blue. I um, wonder if we have any control over the lights in this room. I bet this just turns every light off. Let's see. Yeah. Do you prefer that? But it sucks if I write on the board, right? But I don't much. So anyway, we'll try that for now. Don't fall asleep. I've got this laser pointer. All right. So this is a little easier to see, I hope. So this is a plot. It looks similar to the um, other plot. And what we're doing here is we're showing the Poisson distribution for different values of mu. Okay. So, and again, what we've done here is there's right five. We've done. We're doing five experiments, which actually violates this assumption. But anyway, shows you what the function looks like. And then you're asking the question, um, actually you're not doing five, sorry. You're plotting this as a function of mu, okay? Because, uh, right, so all you need to calculate this function, you need a value of mu, right? And then you can plot this for different values of x, and that's what's being done here. So here's a mu of 0.5, and then you're asking the question, how many times will I get zero, will I get one, will I get two? And as mu gets larger, the, the distribution becomes broad, right? There's more possibilities, also becomes some, symmetric looking, right? You agree that looks symmetric? About 5.5 5, and this looks notably asymmetric, right? All right, so let's see how we might use this thing. All right, so somebody, same people I guess, they make uh, thin films and the probability of make a single defective, so now I'm not telling you the probability of a good film, I'm telling you the probability of a bad one is what, that's about half a percent. It's a different problem than the one before. Okay. So probability that if they make a single th thin film that'll be defective is 0.5 percent. And then we want to ask our qu ourselves the question, what, if we make a thousand of these thin films, what is the probability that there'll be two or more bad ones? Okay, so in other words, we, we, two, three, four, five, all the way up to a thousand. All right? 
the idea more than likely here is that you will accept two defective films out of a thousand but not any more okay so you want to know what the problem well actually yeah okay so when I say more than two, I lied a little bit. When I say more than two, I mean three, four, five, six, all the way up to a thousand. Okay, so if you want to use the binomial distribution, the first, I mean the Poisson distribution, first thing you should decide is, is it applicable? Right, what did I say? P has to be small. That seems pretty small. <laughs> this is the way math is, like there's no absolute how small it has to be. It just gets more and more accurate the smaller P is. Half a percent is pretty small, so that seems okay. And a thousand seems like a pretty large number of samples. So it seems like it should be a pretty good approximation. Now, if I were to give you the probability of, of success, P would not be small, right? And so you'd have to work. That's why I'm giving you it in terms of failure, because P is small for that case. So if you calculate the mean for this distribution, which I gave you on the previous slide, it's the number of samples times the probability. It's 0.5. Yeah? Should we do that? <coughs> yep, typo. I told you. Told you it was going to happen. Yeah. Oh, crap. Now you're saying the whole thing's wrong. Now I'm really bitter. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. Okay, watch this. This is why I get paid the big money, right? You think, oh, <laughs> the pressure's really on this guy. He's going to crack. Not exactly. Okay. <laughs> Hundred's a pretty big number. Okay. Um, so I think that might be right. Is that, does that look better? Yep. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. How about this problem? We make a hundred thin films and we want to know what's the probability more than two will be defective. Okay. So, okay, 100 is not 1,000, but it's still reasonably large. So we say, okay, probability small, okay, calculate the mean, 0.5. Looks good. Now, this is a case where um, you really want to use this idea of the complement because you really don't want to calculate the probability there's 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, all the way up to 100, right? That's a lot of work. So it's easy to calculate what's the probability you'll get no defective films, one defective film, or two, and then subtract that number from one. That'll be the probability that it's, it's three or more, right? So that, that's much easier to do that way. So I'm using that idea here. So the probability that there'll be two or less defective films is, I'm just going to add the probability that there's none, there's one, and there's two. Okay? And to do that, I'm just using the function. Oh, sorry, I have to flip back. I know students hate that. So I'm just evaluating this function with x equals zero x equal 1 and x equal 2 where mu is 0.5. Okay? And if you do that, you get this term you can pull out. That's where I plugged in x equals 0, x equal 1, and x equal 2. So you'll see if you, if you look at the notes offline. Okay, and if you calculate this, unless I made a mistake, which we've seen as possible, um, you get this number here. It's, it's, it's pretty probable it won't have many defects. That's good. So if I want to know what's the probability I'll have greater than 2, also known as 3 or more, it's 1 minus this probability. It's only about 1.5%. So it's pretty, pretty low. So as long as the probability of failure is this low or defective film is this low, then I should be able to make lots that have less than 3 defects. 